Oh God, I think of the words that you spoke to the disciples. The words that you spoke as you prayed to the Father. To let them be one as we are one. Lord, we know that uh, there are difficult times ahead and that we as a church strive to be faithful disciples of yours. So we pray that you let the words of our mouth and the meditation of each heart here be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. The values that we hold as a church and that, that is something that, that I've thought about week after week after week over, over the past year or so because, you know, as I mentioned last Sunday over in the youth room, we, we, have our, we have our mission, which is the mission that Christ gave us in Matthew 28. We have the vision, which, which is kind of how we do ministry, but, but we really have never set down what it is that we value as a church. And I think that has, I don't want to say it's harmed us, but, but I think it's not given us a complete picture of who we are as Royce City Methodist Church. As we take a look at, at who we are as a church, uh, we, we had a team get together to discern what our values are. And if you remember last week, I told you what those values were, and we're, we're preaching through those right now. Last week, we talked about how Christ is the center or Christ is our foundation, that, that cornerstone that we build our lives upon. This week we're talking about unity, then we'll talk about love, and then we'll talk about acceptance. Now, it's easy to take a look at these values and, and see them as, as buzzwords. And, and what I mean by that, we, we, we know what these words mean, but do we really know what the words mean? mean we, we can easily simplify each one of these values to, to to make them fit however we would like for them to fit you know you could probably time and think about the word unity and, and think about how many times in our lives we we have seen shades of unity what are the ways that I think that we can see shades of unity is going back to September 11th, 2001, which next Sunday we will be celebrating 21, not celebrating, remembering, that's probably a better word, remembering uh, what happened 21 years ago. And, and if you're like me, you can remember how easily and, and how, how we became together and how we became one, how, how, how we became united together knowing that our country had been attacked. But we also remember how that unity has kind of faded away, maybe a whole lot more than we would like to admit or uh, like to, uh, to, to fully understand. But there are other things that, that causes us to unite, like football. And we've got the voice of, of the Bulldogs here in the room today, and we know that he is a very much a uniter around the Bulldog pride and, and the work that they're doing. 2-0 and now, which is awesome. But then we have little fractions among the congregation whenever it gets to the collegiate ranks. You know, we've got your Aggies who are unified around Texas A&M. You've got your Longhorns. And then you probably have your only Wildcat, uh, Kansas State Wildcat, standing up here in the pulpit. But, 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 but there's a, a unifying factor around college football. Even though we may razz one another about the teams that we, we root for or, or cheer for, but there, there's still a unifying factor there. But honestly, that unifying factor doesn't last through the tribalism of football. But before we go to our, our scripture today, I, I really wanted us to get a look at what Jesus Christ and, and how he defines what unity is all about. If we take a look at the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 17, sometimes that's called the Disciples' Commencement Address. 
because this is the last time that Jesus speaks to his disciples before he goes into Jerusalem and, and prepares and walks his way to the cross. There, there is a, a phrase that is used within John chapter 17, verse uh, 11, verse 21, and verse 22, that, that Jesus shares with the disciples as he's praying to God. I, I, I hinted to that in my prayer earlier. Jesus says that he would like his disciples to be one. He wanted his disciples to have this one mind, this one heart, this one understanding of the mission that God is calling them to do. But, but, but God, Jesus doesn't just stop there. He, he goes on and he says that I want them to be one just as you, the Father, and I are one. That, that there's this, this combinedness, if you will. There's, there's this, this gathering together of, of the triune God. And he's saying that I would like to see that in them, this unity that, that, that we establish together as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want to see that within my disciples. Paul then takes this a step further. And it gives us the opportunity to see how we can be one. Our scripture for this morning comes from the letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I invite you to follow along in your Bibles, or we'll have the words up on this. We do not have the words up on the screen. I guess I forgot to put that in this morning. Oh, technology. Yeah. Okay, so listen, oh, we do have pew Bibles, if you would like to open up your pew Bibles, or if you have your Bibles with you, here are the words from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Hear the word of the Lord. Paul writes, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility. Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the other. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So how is Paul telling us that we should have unity just like God and the, tri the, the triune God has unity? Well, the first thing that he says is that we should have the same love. Now, we'll get more into love next week uh, as, as we, we talk about exactly what love means and, and how we live into that. But in short... I think how we look at love and how we experience that love is how the, the triune God experienced love. St. August, Augustine, who was an early church father, he give, gives us a picture of how the Trinity expresses love when he says these words. He says that the Father is the one who loves, the Son is the one who is loved, the beloved Son revealed in the baptism of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is the love that flows between them and binds them together, shared with each other. See, see there is a, a full picture of, of exactly what love is. You've, you've heard me say time and time again, and when I shared as my first sermon, the, the, the scripture from 1 John 4, 7 and 8, saying that God is, is love. And, and when we, we as God's people can, can express that love the way God expressed love, then that helps us to be unified. And another way that I can think about sharing about exactly what love is and how love unifies is that it is relational. Now, we can love other people and, and not have them love us back, but, but to fully to understand and to fully experience love and to be united in that love is that we 
can use that love that we have for others, that experience that love from others, that binds us together. And as scripture says, love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers ways that we may, may look at different issues, ways that we may uh, experience life with one another. Love can be a way for us to, to not necessarily look beyond, but to look with. Not, 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 not to say that we'll, we'll sweep things under the rug, but say, you know, our love is so big and, and, and so uh, over-encompassing that we will walk with each other no matter what. That we will walk with each other no matter what. The second way that Paul helps us to see what unity is, he says that we should do nothing out of selfish ambition. I will admit as your pastor, sometimes this is something that I have to really tap down and, and really be careful of. There, there, there's a term that is used called platforming. And, and, and what platforming means is that you, you try to build yourself a, a place where people can hear you, where, where it makes you a lot higher than you really are. It means that you want people to really start seeing you and, and understanding. For example, I, I decided to do a spiritual practice uh, every morning. And I know I've, I've shared this here. If you've been here, you've heard that I do this. I have a morning prayer routine that I picked up from Brian Zond. And, and one of the things that we do during that prayer is that we share in ancient prayers. And, and, and I, I do have a TikTok, and I do have an Instagram, and, and I realize that that's something that's not really done on those platforms, or at least I haven't seen it, you know, sharing of morning prayers. So I decided a few months ago to start doing a morning prayer every morning as a part of my routine, and, and I'll record it, uh, usually in my backyard, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll push it out there. Now, on TikTok they, 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 and, and Instagram Reels, they give you a number of, of how many people are, are viewing your, your TikToks or your Reels. And TikTok could be anywhere between 100 to 200 people. But whenever I first started to do the thing on Instagram, I had numbers that were like in the thousands, like 1,000 to 2,000. I was like, oh, this is awesome. Look at all these people that I'm reaching for the, for the love and grace of Jesus Christ. And then, then something happened. Uh, one time I posted one of the prayers on Instagram and it got 45 views. That, that just, just hit me right here in the heart. I was like, how could that happen? I was so important that people were seeing what I was doing. And I know in the grand scheme of thing and everything, but... My, my attitude changed. And it made me think about why am I really doing this? Am I, am I doing this to, to make myself more important? Or am I doing this to be a servant of the gospel? Am I doing this so I can brag about how many views I have on a certain social media platform? Or am I doing this as a way to allow people to, to pray? when maybe they're in a hurry or when, when, when they feel rushed or maybe when they don't have words to pray for themselves. And that helped me remember that it's not about me. Anything I do around here, it's not about me, but it's about him. Because I know time and time again that left unchecked, selfish ambition turns servants of God into servants of themselves. Selfish ambition turns servants of God into servants of themselves. And it may look differently than, than what you originally thought it would look like. And that's okay. But see, the best way to do this is just to follow the words of Paul when he says... I do nothing out of selfish ambition or a vain conceit. 
because it's not about what I do, but it's always about what he does through us as a church, as a people of God. And we easily can move through with this as we turn to value others above ourselves. I've been a Rotarian for uh, several years now, and, and I love going to Rotary meetings. And I'm thankful now that Rotary is now meeting here in Wesley Hall uh, the first Thursday of each month. And it's great to be with those people. But it's also important to remember that Rotary is not a Christian organization. Rotary is a service organization, and, and the, one of the things that I love about Rotary is that they have a little tagline that says that you believe in service above self, that, that, that we place the service that we do above who we are because we know even as a civil organization that there is a hurting world out there, and, and, and Rotary has done amazing things. Might help battle against polio, uh, doing work around the world, pr building uh, homes and building uh, hospitals and, and schools, all of those type of things is great. And it's great because it helps remind us that it's not about us. It helps remind us that there is something more important that we are to do then build up our own selves. It's looking at others and helping them and supporting them. Rich Mullins, who was a contemporary Christian artist back uh, in the 90s, who, who died uh, in September of 97, he would take a look at valuing others like this. He said, I would like to encourage you to stop thinking of what you are doing as ministry and start realizing that your ministry is how much of a tip you leave when you eat in a restaurant. When you leave a hotel room, whether you leave it all messed up or not, whether you flush your own toilet or not, your ministry is the way that you love people. And you love people when you write something that is encouraging to them, something challenging. You love people when you call your wife and say, I'm going to be late for dinner instead of letting her burn the meal. You love people when maybe you cook a meal for your wife sometimes because you know she's really tired. Loving people, being respectful towards them is much more important than writing or doing music. See, see, Rich knew that, that even though he had a platform, that his job and task was to love others and, and to share that love in, in, in a tangible way. Well, when I read this, I remember at a time where uh, Tracy and I and the kids, we went to a pizza place in Sherman after church one Sunday. And as we were there, there was a, a definitely a, a church group that was gathered, and they had three or four tables all butted together, and the kids were running around the whole restaurant yelling and screaming and everything, and then they, they got up and left. And when we, they got up and left, we, you looked and you saw the table, and it was trashed. I mean, just, just piled high with food. I think it was a buffet place. So there were plates all over the place. There was food on the floor. And, and we know that the restaurant was short-staffed. And we could see the waitress start to cry. Because guess what? They left absolutely nothing for the waitstaff. So Trace and I, we, we talked about it and everything. And we, we gave a, a little bit more of a tip because we knew that this poor woman probably needed and re was relying on that type of income and the work that she would have to do to clean up this mess was more than, than necessary. But it made me sad because I realized what kind of an example or what kind of a way is, is the church being shown through their behavior by leaving a mess, by, by letting her know that they didn't care about her, they just wanted to fulfill their needs. That's how we build unity. 
we look at others and say, how can I help supply their needs? How, how can I love them as Christ loves them? How can I be there for them as Christ has been there for them and for me? They're easy words to say, but it's hard to do. I know that. But I'm thankful that we have an example of how to serve at a table. And that is through the work of Jesus Christ. The, our image of unity is here at this table. Through this communion, it unites the faithful more closely with Jesus and with one another. When we come to this table, we are no longer saying that I am an individual person who is just trying to get through life by myself. It is saying that I am connected to the body of Christ. I am connected as, as one with those who are around me. And as I partake in the breaking of the bread and the pouring of the cup, I then bind myself with one another so that Christ may be proclaimed and that his love, his unity, and his acceptance can be seen through us. My prayer is as we come to this table, we, we feel that acceptance and love and unity through Christ. And we bind together as God's people to be one, just as the triune God is one. Let us pray. Oh God, you have given us the opportunity to be grace-filled, to be filled with your love and your your grace and your compassion. We are reminded, Lord, as you prayed over the disciples, that you pray over us, that you desire us to be one just as you and the Father and the Spirit are one. Help us to see this meal as a relational meal, a meal that, that draws us together so that we may then go out into the world to be your hands and feet to a broken world, to a world that needs your love and your acceptance. Be with us as we partake of this meal, and we pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.